Okay, so um, so I first have to start off with I am actually related to Bill Gates. Um, <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm not making that up. It's 12 generations back. But you work it out, two to the 12, I'll take my share. It'll work out okay. Um, I didn't see that one coming, but, you know. Um, let's see here. So, control. Don't be mad at me, Dave. Oh, that's okay. Look at speed, full screen. So, um, I actually came to the lab in the 80s, and, um, and I actually was supposed to be the last student on HBT the original HBT, which is glass, but um, it sort of ended with a bang. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was actually, uh, I'd started, we were building a little wall, a conducting wall to put into the device, and we were going to stabilize the kink mode with a uh, conducting wall. And I got half of it built, and then that was the end of that. And um, so, you know, actually, it turns out so that the theme of this, uh, this part of the, my discussion here is transition, because the lab was very much in transition at that point. Um, it turns out that actually, technically, I'm a baby boomer. Um, I was born in 1963. It's the last year of the baby boom. Um, I, my parents were born bef just before the war started, so I don't know quite how that works out. But um, so you know, my whole life is really about transition. So I came here. Actually, I worked. At, I came here from Wisconsin, like not too many other people in the fusion field. I actually worked on a machine called Phaedrus Tandem Mirror, built by some guy. Um, in the audience, I guess. But uh, in fact, I, I, I would go from lab to lab, and there'd always be this machine that somebody named Post had built. I'm like, who's this guy? I just can't fucking get away from it. Um, so I came here, and I was going to do this experiment, and uh, it, it, it didn't work out. So I, I went through a period of, uh, of real self questioning about whether you know, plasma physics was really worth hanging around for what was, appeared to going to be a long time. You know, I guess I'd lost a year or two. I was going to, I had a really, you know, I was going to be a fast track out of here because. Yeah, I wasn't going to hang around and waste my money and time in graduate school. Um, and I talked to some guy named Osgood about maybe switching to solid state. Or, um, but it didn't look like I was going to really save any time there. So I stick around. And uh, we built a, a new machine, which actually is still there, um, which means I guess we didn't do a lousy job making it. But, um, and we built it out of uh, spare parts from another lab because, you know, it's too expensive really for a university to build their own tokamak. And it was scheduled for first plasma in 91. So, you know, about the transition, I, uh, you know, it, it's a funny thing being a transitional person. You, know, you end up, like, kind of getting bounced around. You, you don't really control your destiny. You, th you like to think in life that you have something to say about your destiny. But in real life, <laughs> life is a series of random events, and you end up sort of bouncing around. And, you know, the, the, um, the ping pong balls and the, uh, the lottery machine are a really good example, I think, of what has driven my life. Um, but the funny thing is it's worked out pretty well anyway. And, uh, and actually, not a small part of that is actually my experience here. I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures in a minute about, uh, you know, with, with, I actually have a fairly good photo record of the construction of HBTEP, which I, I took and I'd forgotten about. Um, but uh, one of the things I got out of this is I, I built my own tokamak. You know, I, I, I put it together, I pieced it together. I know everything about how to build a tokamak. And I think I might be the last person ever to have done that. You know, we built that STX, you know, that wasn't built by, that's built by a team of professionals, you know, not like a, a guy like me in a lab somewhere. And it may well be the last tokamak ever built in a laboratory of any scale. So um, it's actually been quite an experience. And I didn't realize how much that had done for me until I went somewhere else and started working with people that hadn't done it. Because, um, you know, I just knew how it worked and they didn't. And um, so, anyways, I'm going to go through and I'm going to show you some pictures here. So, this is what uh, HBTEP looked like um, <laughs> when I started. So, there's a ladder there. Where, that's actually where the setting. Is there a point here? I can. No. Okay. Well, so that that hole in the floor right there, that's the middle of HBTEP. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, it was a big job. There was a lot to do, and of course, we have a a team of uh, dedicated professionals down there in the corner designing it. Yeah, it's Tom Iris and, and Mike uh, doing a, enthusiastically doing calculations on our, our Macintoshes uh, about how to build the machine. Um, so we actually, uh, we actually cut holes in the floor and we dug dirt out of the basement. Those are unknown construction workers from some 
firm. But, uh, you know, we, we actually pretty much ripped the place. I, d I didn't realize that you would, you know, that it was a good idea to cut holes in the foundation of a building. I'd never done it before. It was a first. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. um, got away with it. Um, <laughs> So then we started putting together, we have this, uh, that, that actually is my wife. Um, <laughs> and I'll say because she has ears and she, has, she looks just like that now, <laughs> still. Um, so, but she's for scale, you know, this is HBT, this is the pad, we actually got all those pieces from, we built all those things and we, we set up a crane and we built a crane. Um, and, uh, you know, if you compare this to where it was uh, for the experiment, the HBT experiment, you know, this was a really big experiment in comparison. This was really a different beast than what we had before. Um, and, you know, frankly, at the time, it was like, man, all these people are getting all this free work out of me. And I'm just, you know, I'm a professional engineer now. I didn't want to be a professional engineer. I was trying to be a physicist. And I learned how to be a machinist and a welder. And, a, and it was like, well, I, that came in later when I bought my first house, but it came in handy later. Um, so. Here's me. This is, there'll be a few pictures of this skinny guy with the long hair. I don't know really who he is, but um, so we built these conducting wall shells, and we test to fit them and test assemble them. If if you work on HPT, you probably know those pictures. Um, and it was a it was a, actually a really fun time in retrospect. At the time, it was really a lot of work and stressful, and I thought I was going to be there forever. But in retrospect, you know, we, we did a lot of cool stuff. So it can't, I don't know if you can read that, but this is um, the first section of the machine going into place. It actually says, if you can read it, it says your plasma here. Um, this was the same skinny guy with the long hair. Um, and that's a picture of the OH coil dropping into place. I mean, you'll actually be able to see all this stuff if you go down there. Um, and you know, what happened was uh, eventually the machine got put together. This is a Nick Rivera. Well, one of the things about Columbia that I really do uh, remember fondly is the people I worked with here. So Nick was a, you know, was a great guy. And actually, I re remember really well going to, uh, we used to eat lunch at uh, Mama's Diner across the street. And the favorite topic of conversation, if you remember the Steve, is we would go over and we would discuss how much money would we need to actually be rich and be able to stop working. <laughs> and we actually came to a conclusion on, you know, doing, you know, projections that $15 million, at least at the time, was the right amount. So, because uh, $15 million was enough so that you could actually make a certain amount a year, put it, reinvest, not lose any capital. You know, and we were quite serious about it. Unfortunately, we had no plan on actually get the $15 million. <laughs> Certainly wasn't going to come from plasma physics. Um, and, of course, we built, uh, I blew a f few of those things up. In fact... It was, a, it was an exciting period of time um, for more than one reason. Um, you know, you don't realize how much potential a capacitor bank has and <laughs> until you... Uh, you in the same room. <laughs> that's right. So, um, and then the machine was done and it took actually about two years and it was actually done on time. And this is actually where I want to bring in another person who actually had a huge influence. And Jerry doesn't know this story, but... Uh, so Bob Gross came down, the machine was about half done and Jerry and Mike had been going off to do experiments on TFTR, but they were really interested in making sure everything got done right and on time and, and often to the point where things weren't getting done on time. And um, Bob Gross, he, he, secretly, w while you were gone, came down and uh, kind of gathered everybody in the lab together and said, guys, just, just don't, just build it. Just, just don't listen to him, just put it together. And it was a, actually, it was a really big moment in my life. I'm like, you mean I don't have to listen to him? <laughs> That's awesome. Because, you know, and, well, you know, you know the rest of the story. So, um, and in fact, uh, Bob Gross had actually a huge uh, influence on my life in other ways, too. He, um, one of the things I got to do as a, as a graduate student here is um, I also put together the Thompson scanning system as if this wasn't enough. Um, so we had a collaboration <laughs> with... Um, with the uh, Ioffe Institute in St. Petersburg, and I believe at the time it's just to become St. Petersburg. And uh, Jerry sent me off to do a negotiation. And, and uh, Gross came up to me and said, well, you gotta go see this guy, he's a friend of mine. He lives, he's a professor at the University of St. Petersburg. We met during the thaw. It was, this was 1991, it was the year after the uh, 
the coup. And uh, things were really chaotic in Russia. It was a really, really crazy place. And, um, so we went and saw this guy who was a professor at the University of St. Petersburg, and, and he asked if we were going to, we'd ever been to Moscow. You know, and I said, well, no, we have never been to Moscow. I said, well, you can't come to Russia and not go to Moscow. It's not okay. Yeah, good. And uh, so, so actually they set up a tour for us, bought us tickets, got me a tour guide, sent us to Moscow. We stayed in some apartments there. And, uh, and actually, in, in retrospect, you know, there was a lot of really cool ad adventures as a result of this uh, bizarre uh, field we uh, are in. Um, I've been all over the world and it's been really a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, I, I attribute a lot to this experience. I've not been able to, uh, you know, I, I think I finally recovered from the lost income. But, uh, so, um, and oh, one more. So I left about 1993, and then about that time, there was a whole wave of uh, younger people. Actually, there was one guy who came a little early, this guy uh, with the, right behind Jerry, is a guy named uh, Andrea Garofalo, if you know him. He had hair at one point. Um, actually, a lot of people have hair in this picture. That <laughs> um, so they're skinny. They're all skinny, too. Um, <laughs> So, and this was, this was a great group of people to work with. And uh, there was a whole uh, group of people that came actually right after the machine started going that, that, that will be the next wave. And, um, and uh, you know, I think it's, uh, it's actually feels kind of good that, that I built something that's at least lasted, uh, you know, 20 years, so. 